Jen, and I am the founder of Breakthrough, which is a life skill hub. Um, it's mainly does business online, but I also do some stuff in the community as well. Um, before I get started, I would like to say a huge thank you to World Unity Week for inviting me to be a part of this amazing event. I have been taking a look at some of the other speakers, and it's just, it's absolutely amazing. First, the, the process it takes to put one of these things together is huge, um, and it's a lot of work, and I know we have a ton of volunteers, so thank you to everyone. Um, and also just the people that contribute um, and make this kind of platform possible so that we have, you know, people like me that have a, a message. Um, I have such a, a wider audience thanks to people like you. So thank you very much for including me. I, it's an honor to be amongst such amazing professionals. Okay. Um, all right, so what we're gonna to do today is we are gonna talk about, um, my title first of all is Behind the Wall. And uh, that is because one, I lived behind a wall in Berlin, Germany when uh, during the Cold War. Graduated from high school in 1989, which as many of you know, is when the wall fell. Um, and so it's just a huge, huge time in history. Um, and I got to be there, it's very cool. Um, I'm also gonna talk about later in life um, when I figured out what I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> I was uh, working in prison. Um, I think my dad probably would have uh, preferred that I stay on stage and do the theater, but um, at least then he knew, okay, <laughs> starving, starving waitress, that's what my daughter's gonna be. But um, yeah, nope, not, not, so, not so lucky dad, sorry. <laughs> so here I am um, and I get to be here following my calling and, um, and it came from Berlin, uh, and all of those experiences and the amount of freedom and restriction. I mean, it's just, it, we're going to go into that in a sec. But it, that led to me being in, uh, working in prisons and seeing just how different uh, people's lives are impacted and um, what some skills, how they can really have this amazing impact. And, uh, and then later we're going to talk about what uh, more about your four walls and my four walls, like my our current situation, um, and that's how I'm going to tie it all together. Okay, so let's see. First of all, I want to say um, when I was working in prison, I would go in, and at the beginning of each class, they all lasted about three months, 180 hour curriculum, um, the the main one that I that I facilitated, um, and I would go in and I'd say to these 20, usually 20 inmates. Um, I am trying to impact just one of you. And they all look at me like, what? Are you kidding? <laughs> like, what about me? And um, the cool thing is, is that it kind of had a little side effect, which I wasn't really counting on, um, was that they all really were fighting, fighting to be that one person that, that showed me that they got it, that I was impacting them. So that was, that was cool. But um, the fact is, is that I realized going in that, um, if I impact one life, if I have some kind of positive change and show what good stress management and anger management can do or conflict resolution or communication, I mean, think about the impact that has on their home life and then their ability to find jobs and work. There were some great studies done in the 90s. As a matter of fact, Elizabeth uh, Dole uh, uh, did a study, and it was one of those um, – you know, just express, explaining that, that employers aren't necessarily just looking for the Harvard degrees or the, you know, the degrees from your the prestige, list your prestigious school here in your country. Um, so they're not just looking for those big degrees um, anymore. They're also looking for these life skills. You know, they're looking for communication and stress management and team building and values. I mean, that all makes sense. So, um, so by providing these skills, we're like impacting not just their life. So if I'm back to that one person, that one inmate, I am impacting his life and his family because now he's teaching. Like, okay, I, you know, I don't want to just fight like that anymore. I would like to have a conversation and make things better. I'd like to work towards a common goal. I want to uh, live my life where I am uh, meeting needs over time, not just meeting immediate needs. And, and I want to I want to work on some long-term goals. So, I mean, those are the kind of things that... I mean, it's just, it's huge. 
when you open up that door. It's it's crazy. And so it's kind of like going on top of a mountain and taking a big feather pillow and just ripping it to shreds and just watching the feathers go everywhere. You have absolutely no idea how that one impact, how that one person, how much it's going to filter through time. The feathers just go everywhere. So um, it's kind of similar to, you know, spreading a rumor. Rumors are nasty. And if you spread a rumor, you never know how much damage you're going to do because you never know how far it's going to go. So the same idea as that, but positive. <laughs> okay. So I just want to get, wanna, I want to have one person that's watching, maybe comment or something, um, email me. You'll get, you'll get the contact information at the end um, later on. It, you know, it'll be attached somewhere somehow, I'm sure. But I would love to hear... Um, about your conversation because what I'm asking is not not tough. I just want to change a conversation at the dinner table or um, at coffee with friends or at work or you know, somewhere. Where does the conversation change where you start talking about making life skills more accessible and impacting uh, your own family and um, bringing some some new skills into the home? That because we're FYI, we're all learning every day in. The life's great classroom is all around you. I'm, I'm in it right now. I'm learning stuff right now. And um, I'm learning that it's really hard to talk to myself on, on the camera so, with nobody else. But um, And it's also really hard to keep everything else quiet and three boys quiet and birds and dogs. It's crazy. So I'm learning right now. Um, but so the, the point is, is that if you have that conversation and say, how what can I do to bring new... Um, new skills and, and stuff in the home that I'm going to consider success. One person. One. Uh, this morning, my kids and I started something new and I've been holding off on it. Um, and I had it for the summer, but I wanted to start um, really having an impact on converse <laughs> impacts on work for the day. Sidebar. So I wanted to have that conversation with them. I have three boys and I wanted to, like start something that wasn't just about chores and what they're going to do for the day and how no more electronic time and you know how much TV are they spending you know I I, I want to have a conversation um, that's guided and that talks about can you visualize your future that was today's conversation so can you just the importance of I, I don't I do care what it is just so you know but the point is that I don't care what your answer is at this moment. <laughs> I just want to have the conversation. I want you to start thinking because I realized as they were kind of joking and getting used to the idea that in the back of their mind, they're starting to work on it. Like, Oh, that makes a lot of sense. I usually make a lot of sense. Um, but if I start being able to visualize what I want to be, then I'm going to be able to see the cues that are coming up and then I'm going to be able to, you know, more likely to make it happen than if I'm, if I'm not thinking ahead as far as what kind of decisions I need to be making for my future. So anyway, it was a fantastic conversation. It was a great start. We just took a little bit of time. Um, so I'm just, I'm curious, you know, what can you do in your family that can start that, that ball rolling? Um, because really that's, that's where we can make change. That's where we affect change is within ourselves. Um, and then, you know, moving forward, community and moving forward, voting, and, you know, there's just, there's so many different ways, but we have to start somewhere. So anyway. One. Okay, so uh, let's go to Germany. <laughs> I was born in Berlin. Um, my dad was a pilot for Pan Am, so I got to fly everywhere um, for free. As a matter of fact, I found where to go. Uh oh, where to go? It's somewhere here. Maybe not. Yes, it is. Okay, I found it. Look what I found. <laughs> I was like rummaging through stuff and I was like, oh, this is perfect. I'll show it. So this was my little, this was a ticket. And I got to just talk about freedom. Uh, uh, even before I was 18, I could just take one of these tickets and I would just write where I wanted to go. As long as it was signed by dad and had his, his ID number and everything. I'd say where I wanted to go and I wanted to go at uh, which airport and, and they would, uh, they would take it. And sometimes I would even have little vouchers to be able to upgrade and sit in first class, which was really cool, um, especially in Pan Am, such a classy airline. Anyway, um, good times. So, yeah, so I was really um, lucky. I was really lucky, and I 
uh, experience Germany where if you think about it, you've got all these different cultures in Berlin because it was occupied by by multiple countries. So you had Great Britain and you had France and you had America and you had Russia and you know, you had all these different culture and and with all of these different cultures also came um, a, a, a good learning curve, I want to say. You know, it's kind of like, you know, if you didn't understand someone's social norm, then it was like, oh, well, you know, they're not, they're not from my country. Give you some allowance. Um, so it was, it was interesting as I was learning, um, you know, what was acceptable and what wasn't, um, that, that I had that, that kind of freedom to make mistakes and, and still feel really confident and secure and interesting. So... Um, I appreciated that about Germany. And to be honest, like, it's really hard to um, explain it, it, it uh, what it was like living in Berlin because um, it was so magical. It was like almost like a movie um, in retrospect, you know, and I'm thinking back on it because it was like, you know, it's, we had to we would take the duty train, the duty train to be able to go play sports, and that would leave at all times of the night, would never leave at the same time. Um, it would stop and go on the way into um, West Germany so that um, people wouldn't know uh, where the train was when and um, when we would get there. So sometimes we'd get there at 4 in the morning, sometimes we'd get there at 11, you know, hopefully in time for our game. But, um, but it was just a lot of fun. And, um, and, and with that, you know, that idea of security... Um, also came this other level of awareness that I had to have really young, um, that that my actions have an impact on not not just you know me and my family. It, it matters wherever you are, right? But but there was this heightened level where it was like you know, my friend um, accidentally pulled the emergency brake on the duty train, and um, it was a security issue because now we were stuck where we weren't supposed to be. We, you know, of course they radio and you know, all that good stuff, but it was like a huge deal. And, you know, there was, um, fears of, you know, are we going to get, um, asked to leave the country and, I mean, that never happened. And, um, but, but, there, but it was a, you know, there was, there was different things to be concerned about let's put it that way. And, um, another example of that was just, I'm going to, um, just quickly share that. So my friend and I, when we were 16, went to the Von's Eight. It's like, it's this amazing lake that we just kind of, chill out and sunbathe and have a good time and on our way home we took the wrong bus I just we took it the wrong way it was the right bus <laughs> but that doesn't help if you're going the wrong way and we got to the end of the line and they asked us to you know we can't stay on the bus we have to go on this other bus that took us then to the end of that line which took us to a van again which because the line was broken you know the, the um they were working on the roads we had to take the small van again, which was weird, right? Because you would go from this big city bus or you know, city transit bus to a little van again. It's very similar to what we had when I was growing up. Um, and uh, it just seemed very sketchy, you know, kind of scary. And so we started wondering what was going on. And I was starting to get nervous about when we were going to get home and how we'd get home um, before cell phones and GPS. Those were the days, right? So anyway, we get to this cul-de-sac and a lady sitting there and she says, oh, you should go while you're here, take advantage of this time and go look at the wall because there's this break in the wall. And it, um, and there was, we, we walked back and, you know, if, if uh, you haven't seen the wall, if you can imagine it, there's these huge sections that got lowered down. So if you can imagine one of the sections just wasn't there and it was, it had barbed wire um, to, you know, prevent people from easily passing. Um, and so... We went to go look at it, and sure enough, you know, on the other side is this huge, it's a watchtower, and so they're like, go and they take this huge thing, and they're starting to point it to us, and we're freaking out, and we're like, oh my god, what's that? You know, to us, it was like this huge gun, you know, it's like some kind of cannon or something that was going to, um, gonna, you know, warn us. We didn't, I, I personally didn't think we were going to get shot, but definitely a warning. <laughs> um, it was most likely in my rational brain now thinking back, probably the camera, just saying that. but anyway, it's huge, um, but growing up, you know, and, you know, and being a teenager and superhuman and nothing can possibly happen to you, um, I, you know, jumped over and I took a picture anyway, and then in my infinite wisdom, my friend asked me to take her 
picture as well. And so I did it again <laughs> because being stupid once wasn't enough. Anyway, pushing pushing limits and boundaries, right? So um, anyway, so I bring all of that up because it just, it, you know, it, I recognize that there's uh, a lot of uh, countries that are represented here at World Unity Week and people that are watching that come from uh, countries that are under duress and, and not um, as secure as I would hope that they could be. And so I, I want to just, first of all, um, wish you well, and, um, and then uh, honor that, I guess. And so, uh, but also that kind of maybe you can compare that experience to that heightened security. There's just a different level of awareness that happens. Um, and the fact that I was American and I was there and I was free and able to make these choices and able to take these pictures and stay at the Bonze and um, travel, write my own tickets, you know, it was it was a big um, a big deal. And when I left um, in um, to go, I gra I graduated early, so it was before the wall fell. And then um, actually, I when I was back in college, I was in my dorm and I was walking across the hall and I saw this little TV and there were people dancing on the wall. I was like, what the hell are you watching? <laughs> Sorry. And I'm like, what are you watching? And, and, uh, I was, yeah, it was people on the wall. And so within the week I withdrew from school and just flew over right away. because I just had to be a part of it. My friends were still in school there and, and this amazing point in history was happening. So, um, so I was there for the Brandenburg Gate when it opened, and I got shuffled in with my friend Don, and we were like little sardines, and it was wet and cold and um, amazing, absolutely amazing. No passport, no idea how to get home, but we found the U-Bahn, and it was so strange. It was really crazy. You know, the, the U-Bahn and the train was just, I mean, completely void of any character whatsoever on that side. Um, and then, you know, as soon as you crossed over, you've got all that glitz and glamour of the West. It was a big difference. It was a change. Um, and, uh, and then I got to, you know, dance on the wall to bring in 1990. So it's a, yeah, it was a crazy experience. So going from that wall then to the wall in, uh, you know, fast forward in the early 90s, I started working for a um, program that, that taught in prison and still in um, taught social skills in prison, and this company had started out um, with a curriculum for work, the workforce, it's actually called Workforce, um, and my aunt um, was actually the author um, of the curriculum, and it was amazing, it helped reduce the recidivism rate by 80%, high-risk offenders, super, super important and huge, um, and I got to be a part of it, and I really, again, felt blessed. <laughs> And um, one of the things that happened is that, you know, I'd go in and I'd, I'd facilitate these, these courses and these, this curriculum, and I'd see how their lives were changing just with the way they communicated or the way that they talked about their um, outlook, you know, what, what, was, what would potentially be next for them. And, um, and it was motivating, definitely motivating to see to see the change and to hear the speeches at the graduations and that was that was fantastic the thing that really stuck with me though um was that they would without fail at least i mean at least a third of the class would ask me why didn't we learn this sooner and it wasn't for the reason that they were saying you know i probably wouldn't have committed crime if i learned this i mean it wasn't anything that grandiose but they wanted to know because it was that impactful for them that they um, they wish they had, they had known some of these things earlier, and so um, you know I didn't really have an answer for them. I don't I don't know why society says you know <laughs> sports can have coaches and and you can have teachers and professors, but life skills just learn that at home. <laughs> the classroom is just so uneven; it's not fair. So I don't have an answer for them, but um, but my my company did, and their answer was to then open up an alternative school for teen moms. So then I got to go pilot a project in the community. Now, this was a huge turning point for me um, because now I was part of, you know, a different type of change. 
I got to start networking with this amazing group of people headed by one of my favorite people in the world. I call him my Michael. My Michael has a way about him that inspires you to be a better person. I don't like better than you ever thought you could be. And I, I just, I'm so grateful for that time and, and experience to see what it's like to be part of a team that really uh, supports and initiates and inspires growth for everyone. Um, I, he was never afraid of being outshined. It was kind of like, here's the spotlight, you go. And, and he just, Michael knew and got that, that this, the, it wasn't just the strength and numbers. It was like, it was empowering to feel worthy and successful. It was, in, it made me want to do more and be more and it, and it worked. I, I really think that that is a huge part of why I'm continuing the work I do is I just have that faith that that one person, you can make a difference. That one person can make a difference. So here I am. Thank you. Love you. Um, and he's ruined me for life, though, actually. I just have to sidebar. <laughs> I do want to say, I can no longer work for anybody who tries to climb up a ladder over me. <laughs> it's like, it's not, has nothing to do with prestige. It has nothing to do with them getting further along. I just... If it's a competition at work, you don't have a common goal. Like, it's such a waste of time. It's so hard. Anyway, okay, sidebar. Okay, so, so here I am, and now we've like we're working on these uh, with these teen moms and and GEDs, same curriculum that we worked with the inmates. You now we've we've rewritten it a little bit so that it um, applies to to teens and to youth. I also did a um a, a pilot in at the high school itself. And then some other smaller schools, we, we start branching out. It was really a cool time. Um, and the interesting thing is that, again, about one third of them would ask me a question that, once again, I didn't have an answer to. And that question was, how do I bring these skills home? Darn it. <laughs> I got stumped again. How does this keep happening? So now I have, how do we, why didn't we learn this sooner? How do I bring these skills home? Because the fact is, is that it's true. If I think about, you know, when I learn something new in my child, you know, I you know, go to my dinner table and I say, hey, I learned this new way of, of, of managing my stress. You know, we need to, we need to watch what we eat, limit the sugar and limit the salt, you know, I'd have a conversation with my mom. You know, that would, that would, we'd look at more information. We'd go to the library. Um, and that was, that was them. But for these, these girls, these mom, these teen moms, they were, they were like trying to go home and then they were getting laughed at or don't use that stuff that you learn from the community center. Don't, don't, you know, don't bother me. And so they were really frustrated as they're like realizing, realizing and recognizing the value of some of these skills and wanting to pass them on to their kids. Um, but then, you know, not being able to practice at home, I mean, it was like, a, yeah, it was really big. So, um, so then, of course, I, I like a challenge. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so, um, how do I bring this stuff into the home? It just, it stayed there for a while. I never, I never lost that question. Um, and I, uh, need to fast forward now because what happened is I ended up leaving that um, job. We moved back down to California from Oregon, and I had to get. I had to finish my degree. <laughs> I, had to, I had to go back to college because now, now I knew what I needed, and you know, I had already found the ceiling, and I didn't like it. You know, I, I'd gone to work with um, senators and and do team meetings and and you know all that stuff because of, of my Michael, <laughs> um, and I got to be part of some really amazing things. And I thought, wow, this cannot be the end for me. I need to have the education to back me up, and so. I went back and I you know, got a degree at, and uh, learned more about criminology and sociology and, and that kind of thing. And just people really, it's amazing. Once you find your topic and your, your, um, your passion, it just flies by. Whereas school was kind of difficult for me in the beginning. I you know, 
Oh, the wall came down. I'm going to withdraw. I think I have strep throat. I'm going to withdraw. You know, I'm just always, always finding reasons to, to leave. I'm going to go get married in Holland. So, yeah, so I did all these different things. <laughs> but finally, I found what I what I loved, and, and I just blasted through those classes. And they thought it was, would take about a year and a half or two years for me to finish, and I did it in, you know, a year and a summer. So, um, so it's amazing when you find your your calling. So now, um, now I've gotten a few other jobs and I've worked in residential treatment and I've worked in alcohol and drug and I've worked, um, with kids, I've worked with adults, I've worked with parents, I've, you know, I've got all these like amazing experiences, but there's this one thing that eludes me and that is how do I bring these life skills home? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, it took having kids to figure this one out. So what happened was that I have, now I have three boys, and they are, um, they were, oh, I want to say like three and five, like twins that are three and then five, and they're like, I'm pulling my hair out, I'm getting, you know, patch, bald patches, <laughs> and they're just running them up, and they're just like running all over the place, and uh, I'm having to like remind them to brush their teeth, and picking up shoes, and make your bed, and that's not okay to wear to school, you know, like all that stuff that, that really kind of takes away from getting ready for work. It's exhausting. I don't know how people do it. For all of you out there that are still doing this, I am with you. I feel you're out. <laughs> um, so I had this epiphany. I just, just, wait a minute, Jen, you goofball. <laughs> That's not exactly what I said, just for the record. Just keeping it due. Um, but I was like, what a, what a silly person. I, you actually have the kind of job that you're supposed to bring home. This teaching the life skills thing. I mean, I was always kind of communicating where I, man, not managing my stress really well, actually. Uh, here's my pride. <sighs> Horrible at managing stress. But I was doing all this other stuff. Um, so anyway, so now I'm like, okay, I need to, I need to bring it home. Oh, I'm bringing it home. Let's see how this can work. So I'm taking all of the stuff that I facilitated in prison and worked with, with the inmates, teen moms, and what was important to kids and them, and residential treatment centers. And then they had this reward system that was awesome. That wasn't you know like tons of money. It was like allowance was based you know upon it um, about earning earning points and you know uh, completing what was necessary for the day. Um, and I thought that um you know let's throw this all together, mix it together, and create something. So I did that. Um, I created a, well, it's, I call it a game because it's you know, more enjoyable. But really, it's like a tool. <laughs> it's a parenting tool. Um, Skies is a game. And so they have, so, you know, you write down these expectations of what you, what you want your uh, kids to accomplish for the day or what your expectations are you have the conversation with the, with your kids you know well, what kind of things do you think you can do because if you think about it at three and five they you know they they were learning how to uh, tie their own shoes they were you know learning new responsibilities it was time to step up the game right so you know so we started writing down some responsibilities that would be real easy for them to accomplish you know brush your teeth they, they've been doing that for years um, but the key was brush your teeth without me having to ask you to do it. Then, um, it was make your bed, be respectful, help your brother. I mean, all these like really cool things, but, but not nothing that was really structured before. So, um, I'm not kidding. And, and I'm, I'm really not kidding. Within, uh, we implemented it and within 24 hours, like the next day, I was a half an hour early for work, not, not for work, but to leave. I was a half an hour early, like, to get ready to leave the, out, out the door. And I was like, what is going on? Like, it really didn't click what had happened. And then I realized it, um, is that the, I hadn't I'd been able to get ready for work. I like, didn't actually take a nice shower. I, you know, all these, like, things that we take for granted when we don't have kids, <laughs> I was able to do. So, um... That was like, oh, okay, I am bringing it home. <laughs> so now we've got um, communication and we've got team building. We've got all these things that have worked in the game. And then we added to it. I added 
of the, I added some of the program um, uh, um, lessons like, uh, and made it on it to turn it into an online course so people could, you know, work at their own pace um, and kind of restructured it so that they could work on it on their own pace, which was cool. Um, and so, you know, once again, now I've got people that are talking to me about utilizing these, these skills, you know, communication, for example, is the easiest one to go with, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on conflict resolution. Now this is how I'm doing it. And, you know, what are your suggestions? So the conversations are starting. So, um, anyway, so here we are, we are successfully in the home getting parents and kids alike to work together on life skills with a curriculum that, that can be, you know, standard. So, um, so that is kind of like wraps up that, that piece of my, of my talk. Um, and it goes into the next part really important because then it's like, what, well, where's the next step? What am I, again, why am I seeking this platform? What am I looking to do? Because it doesn't end here. Like I, you know, I used to, you know, I made the game, that was six years ago. That was a while ago. And so when um, I'm looking at it now, um, okay, I've been doing life schools and teaching, facilitating, and creating curriculum and doing 25, 25 years almost. That's insane. Anyway, so for that long I've been in this environment and in this, what keeps me going? You know, and it's, and it's, first of all, the job's not done. Um, second, you know, it, there's, um, there's, there's a lack of understanding, um, I think, and I, and I can certainly see it in my own family, um, extended family, where um, the importance of having life skills and not having them be uh, stigmatized or not, you know, just uh, Asking for support is okay. You no, know, you are okay. You are exactly where you're supposed to be at this moment. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing, and it's okay to have a moment where you need support and you just need something, somebody to that to tell this, something you know in a different way, and you just have this aha moment, and then you move forward. It happens to me all the time. I have these books behind me that sometimes I'm just stumped, and I don't know where to go, and I. Despite all of these, you know, friends that I have to call and I, it's like I need something and I'm not sure what it is. So I go to my list of experts and I, I'll just, you know, thumb through a book and, you know, something comes to light. I was like, that's what I needed. It's the power of intention. I needed to, that was my message today. It's my intention. That's, that's a good message. So, um, uh, that's, that's where, that's where I'd, I, I want to keep this movement going because I, I love being, you know, I call myself an owner. I loved being a creator, inventor. That was cool for a while. <laughs> you know, but now I think I've settled. You know, all that other stuff can, can go. I don't uh, care about titles too much. Um, but I like the idea of being a life skill advocate. You know, speaking up for life skills and speaking up for people that, that need that support. Um, and... Um, uh, need the support to be supported almost right like I mean that's part of the conversation that I'm asking you to have really is is how do we how can we take out judgment um, when people ask for support it's almost like you're seeing you know, like, like it's a weakness um, the other piece is that um, and I get triggered with it all the time because it's the judgment thing that drives me insane judgment is so uh, useless. It just gets in the way. But um, I want to say, for uh, when, you know, working with inmates, I saw uh, some amazing change. Okay, change is inevitable. It happens. The fact is, is that when this these kind of things happen, and they and the change that happens, um, the inmates are going to come back home and live in your community. And for the most part, I don't um, always see a great response or reception waiting for them from, from 
the community from society. You know, it's, it's hard to get a job. It's hard to, um, you know, you have to, if it's a sex crime, you have to register. I get all of that. I really do. I get all of it. But, you know, there's the, uh, there was one example of um, someone that I, uh, I, when I was, I was speaking at a conference and, and he was, um, he was there and he was sharing, he was a, he was a graduate and he had gotten the job after, um, oh, I think it's important to, to note that his crime was uh, not a uh, not a high risk. Uh, he was not at, at high risk to reoffend. Is what I'm trying to say. So he um, and it was you know his parents pressed charges because he had sex with his girlfriend who was under eighteen, and he was young too, but he was over eighteen. I, mean, I think it was like nineteen. And I, and I and I don't want to debate or really go into any um, conversation about that issue because that's everybody gets to have their their opinions as far as how they feel about that. Um, but I do think that it's important to acknowledge that, you know, when he, he was judged already, he went in front of a judge, he was judged. Then he served his time. Now he's home, gets a job, he's got a fiance, a, a convertible car, and, you know, things are looking great. There's this one little thing that he didn't do. He didn't mark down on his job application that he had been convicted of a crime. Again, I recognize the importance of being honest and, you know, you can't, <laughs> it, it's kind of, it's a really tricky scenario, a, a situation, but, um, but he didn't, no, he, so he, he, he gets fired, of course, and loses his job, and um, I, I don't know the rest of the story, I don't remember if they, he stayed engaged or not, but, uh, or kept the car. <laughs> But I, I do know that he lost his job, and, and my question really is, you know, now what? Like, if if these people, you know, I'm going to have him represent everyone again. So if these people are going to get out and come back in your community, they've taken all these courses that your tax pay, tax paying dollars have paid for. Um, some, because some prisons do have, have courses that are worthy. Um, now they're back in the community. How are they going to be able to be um, successful? Because... They have family members. <laughs> they, I want them to be able to support their family and pay their taxes and go to PTA and you know I want I, I want that for them. I want everyone to have a successful life. So it, you can't. I, I I personally don't think that it's that it's um, realistic to to put this huge cloud over them and then you know judge them again because they're not being successful when they're getting out of prison. And it's strain. It's it's stressful. You, you leave a bad scenario and you can't afford to pay for your family. You commit crime in order to make men uh, meet your needs. And then you have to pay for the crime because you get caught. And then you go back to the same scenario. Where exactly are they supposed to, to change the behavior? And that was when they learned the social skills. They got their GED maybe in prison. or they, You know, there's, there's all these different programs out there. Change, again, is inevitable. It's going to happen. But I just, I'm asking you to make part of the conversation, you know, if, if you're going to be part of that change and have an impact, part of it's going to be about how, just about how you kind of maybe shift your, your feelings a little bit about the full experience. I'm going to leave you with one last story. Um, when I was, uh, when I was reading one of the, uh, this story about a man who, who went on a train and, and I honestly don't know if this is a true story. It just, but it resonates with me. And I can picture it being true. Um, so he, he goes on a train and he's sitting down and then the train stops and a family gets on, or uh, sorry, a father and three children get on. And the children are just going crazy and they're being really disrespectful and rude to the dad and, and passengers are starting to get uncomfortable and he's getting uncomfortable and, but, and, and stressful. And as I'm reading this, I'm like, oh my God, I would go nuts. Like, how would I respond to this? And I'm thinking, how would I positively, how would I use my social skills to be able to communicate with this guy? And um, I really, I, you know, I can't really think of anything. But then um, he finally decides he's going to, you know, just tap him and, and ask if he recognized that his kids were not behaving. And, um, and the father says, you know, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so sorry. They just lost their mom. Ouch. Oh my God. Can you, 
Like that just changed the whole story for me. All of a sudden I'm like, those poor kids. I mean, yeah, they're not allowed to be misbehaving and stuff, but all of a sudden that that piece of the puzzle gets put slid in and suddenly the judgment goes away. Like I get why they're why they're misbehaving. They're mad at the world. They're frustrated. They're sad. They're scared. They're desperate, right? And so that impacts their behaviors. And so suddenly I'm like, what else can I do different to, to support that family? Um, and really, again, it's just, and I, I only bring up that, that story just because it's that I, I, for me, it was that kind of big, um, eye-opening moment where I went from one perception of the story to like, it just blew open, you know, totally changed the story. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm hoping that something similar happens for you. Um, so, uh, what is next? So, um, now, uh, so obviously I, I still, um, sell the game. Uh, it used to be called Flinder because it was Flinder with butterfly and Dutch and my kids were part Dutch. Um, but then we've, we've changed it now to say please. And I'm through this, going through this whole rebranding thing and, it's pretty cool. And now I'm opening the doors and letting other professionals uh, come in and, and share their material. Because, I mean, really, <laughs> you know, if I were to learn anything from my Michael, it was their, their strength in numbers. And there are things out there, you know, I'm sure there's a better story than the dream story to be able to open those eyes for you. And um, if they need to be open, if I, if I have a point. Um, so, I, you know, inviting these uh, other professionals to the table is uh, is where I'm at right now so that again it's that idea of networking and being able to provide and advocate for what I feel is um, you know something that I can stand for and, and put my work hours towards you know that's why I, that's why I'm here that's why I do what I do and that's why I'm passionate about it um, and I will continue on I don't know where uh, where I don't know if I'll ever my you know it's my uh, my family has, has Honestly, ask me when are you gonna stop paying your soul? <laughs> I'm like, no, never, <laughs> probably never. It's a it's a worthy cause, and um, I hope that uh, I've I've uh, used my time wisely for the end of the week. Thank you again for letting me be here. Um, the uh, walls, hopefully, are blown open a little bit. You can see a little bit more, and allow more information in. Um, and uh contact information at the end. Thank you for listening. And um, again, I just, you know, I hope I got one of you. Just write in the comments if I got you. Just curious. Thank you.